Today we're going to be discussing a chapter from this work, The Relevance of the Beautiful and Other Essays by Hans Georg Gadamer. And this is the brief essay entitled, appropriately enough for our course, Philosophy and Poetry. And in this essay, uh, Gadamer begins to sketch out in a rather programmatic way, not the final word by any means, but to explore the relationship between philosophy and poetry, in particular within the medium of language, insofar as philosophy and poetry both represent um, something unique about language, uh, unique ways in which language manifests itself, or unique um, ontological regions of language. And in particular, the idea that uh, there is a commonality, or he describes it as a, as a proximity or nearness of philosophy or poetry to each other relative to um, the realm of language, the ontological region of language that we might describe as ordinary language or everyday language or practical language. Uh, so you have practical language on one side, the ordinary everyday speech that uh, I'm using right now that we commonly converse with. And then you have uh, properly philosophical and properly poetic language. And there's a continuum here. So there's a continuum both within uh, poetic language and within uh, philosophical language, uh, and also between uh, poetic and philosophical language and ordinary everyday language. So it's, it's not that he's trying to um, hermetically seal uh, different regions, different ontological regions of language off from one another in any way. But he is trying to, to suggest ways in which philosophy and poetry do, in fact, belong together because of the way in which they are set off in their uh, very essence, in their, in their ontology from ordinary or everyday language. So, so that's what's going on here. He's trying to explore these connections. And he begins, uh, appropriately enough, with a one-paragraph history of the modern relationship of philosophy and poetry. He describes how the relationship of philosophy and poetry was introduced into the common consciousness at the end of the 18th century by German Romanticism. And then how, meanwhile, soon after this, in the 19th century, philosophy forfeited its prophetic status, its ability to speak to the culture uh, at large about what is what it means, um, how it should orient itself, what's important, what's not important, that kind of prophetic status in a, in a generic sense. I'm not talking about a necessarily religious form of prophecy here, but just the, the, the way in which um, a cultural leader, a spiritual leader in a broad generic sense relates to uh, his or her culture. So philosophy at various times had this prophetic status and lost it in the 19th century as it retreated into uh, what Gadamer regards as rather sterile epistemological problems. And instead, what occupied this place was something continuous with poetry, uh, other forms of literature, in particular the French and Russian novel. Uh, he cites as examples of uh, a kind of marriage of philosophy and poetry that had this prophetic uh, status within European culture in the 19th century. And then in the 20th century, along comes the existentialist movement, which seemed to reestablish a prophetic role for philosophy. But in the meantime, philosophy had become professionalized. It had become thoroughly academic. Uh, it had developed its own quasi-scientific methodology in the form of uh, formal symbolic logic. And so, uh, the uh, question about whether existentialism or existentialist writers that flirted with literary devices like Heidegger, like Sartre, or, you know, flirted with actual literature, engaged in actual literature, not just flirted with it, but engaged in actual literature, in the case of people like Sartre or Camus, um, there's a question whether they, people like this even belonged in the academy, were they even professional philosophers? So that's where you have the famous break between analytic and continental philosophy resulting. And it results on the same ground over which philosophy and poetry meet and part, uh, come near to each other, seem to recognize an affinity for one another, but then at the same time recognize a tension or even a potentially a contradiction, an incompatibility between 
their modes, uh, if not their aims. Now, the tension between philosophy and history isn't ancient. It's not a distinctly modern problem. It's an ancient problem. Plato was, ironically, as I've noted before, a critic of the poets, but ironically, because he himself was a great poet. And in addition to this ir irony, uh, Gadamer also notes the irony of the desire within a culture formed by the, at least the legacy of Christianity uh, of wanting to separate uh, poetry and philosophy or more generally but imagery and thought within a culture that's formed by Christianity in that way when we look at the ways in which imagery and thought are inter interwoven and combined in both the Old and the New Testaments. Who would want to separate poetry and philosophy in such a culture? Gadamer essentially asks. So there's an irony to this tension that has always existed between poetry and philosophy. There's a philosophical question that's raised by the apparent opposition of poetry or imagery, as we could call it, uh, and philosophy or thought, as we could describe it alternatively. And that's this question. What is language such that it is able to encompass both poetry on the one hand and thought or philosophy on the other? What is language such that it is able to encompass both poetry and thought? So this is the way Godmer poses this question of the relation of poetry and philosophy in this essay uh, as a question about language, about the nature of language. What is language such that it, it can have these two possibilities, both as its own intrinsic or inherent possibilities, thought and imagery. Uh, so it's a, it's a rather um, specific question, in, interesting and, and perhaps understudied question. What is language such that it can be both philosophical language and poetic language, both? Um, is this a question? That's a, you know, a meta question. We could ask about this question itself. But at any rate, that's what Gadamer um, poses as the question for this essay. Uh, complicating this is the general situation of language, which is that generally our speech acquires meaningful determinacy and clarity within a living context and a concrete situation in which we are addressed. Uh, the life world that we referred to earlier is the normal site in which language has its life. Uh, it gets its clarity because of the way in which language is used within forms of life. To allude to the concepts of Ludwig Wittgenstein and his, his ideas about meaning. Meaning is the use of language as it's used within uh, for certain determinate forms of life. We know what these words let's say, that refer to um, kitchen cutlery. We know what these words are. We, they're meaningful to us because of the way in which they actually function in the kitchen, just to take a very pedestrian uh, type of example. But that's what he's talking about when he refers to the living context and the concrete situation. In such context, speech, he says, does not stand for itself stand for itself, but rather it passes over. So that's uh, one opposition here between two different uh, ontological uh, you know, statuses or um, conditions of speech, either uh, standing for itself or passing over. Um, into, we'll just say, objects. So speech either stands for itself or passes over into objects. And this is in particular going to be the uh, situation with respect to uh, poetry. It's standing for itself. But in the ordinary context, what happens is our speech immediately passes over into objects. You know, I say, hey, can you pass me a knife? And you say, sure. And what, what are we thinking about? What does our speech sort of direct us towards? Well, it directs us towards an object, which in the object itself has a kind of um, 
linguistic coloring or flavoring or whatever metaphor you want to use because I see that thing, as it were, through the filter and lens of my language that gives me uh, the ability to recognize this thing as a knife and to make sense of it. But the word itself, the word knife itself is not something that draws my attention in that circumstance. Rather, the, the word knife becomes completely transparent to the thing that it's directing me towards, namely that thing that's on the kitchen table. But in poetry, things are different. In poetry, the word is standing for itself. So what does that mean? That's the, I mean, I guess even initially, we can get kind of a vague idea of what he's uh, referring to based upon the contrast with passing over into objects. It, the, the word sort of draws attention to itself rather than to an object. But in what way does it draw attention to itself? What does this um, standing for itself ultimately amount to? He also talks about this standing for itself as bearing its own authority, bearing its own authority. So we'll add that. Stands for itself or bears its own authority. And the second formulation, I think, is introduced more to accommodate philosophy in philosophical language, because that's the a characteristic of philosophical language par excellence, the idea that it bears its own authority. In other words, philosophy is supposed to not presuppose the uh, necessity or the justification of any of its own terms. It's supposed to justify these within the context of its own procedures, at least within modern philosophy, this is very clear. And you can argue that this is something that goes back to Plato, this idea. The philosophy has to bear its own authority. If there are philosophical concepts that are introduced, they have to define or explain themselves, and they have to justify themselves. They need to be argued for, unlike in everyday life, where we just help ourselves to various terms. We don't worry about whether these terms are justified, you know. So, in everyday life, I might um, help myself to a metaphor like saying, you know, you just told me something, but I'm not really processing what you're saying. And no one objects to that language because it's become come part of common parlance, but it's a metaphorical extension of what happens in a computer. And in philosophy, we would, we would ask, well, wait a minute, is that language actually justified? Are, is the human mind actually a computer? Literally? Is it just like a computer? If so, how and in what ways can we justify these claims? So that's a sense in which uh, the speech of philosophy bears its own authority, if it has any authority. It has to be able to justify its own claims and assumptions and terminology within its own procedures, not from outside. There's no place outside of philosophy in which to justify the terms and processes of philosophy. There's just philosophy. So that's the... Um, the kind of commonality, and, the, and whether these things, of, these ideas of standing by itself and bearing its own authority really belong together as, as the same idea, essentially, is, is a question to be raised. Certainly standing by itself, as I said, seems to belong more to poetic language, which draws attention to itself in a way that's fairly obvious and straightforward, um, which you may or may not think philosophy does. And similarly, it's pretty clear that philosophy bears its own authority, but whether poetry does that... Um, you know, there is something about poetic rhetoric that can be, that can seem to be self-justifying. And Gadamer is someone who thinks that the beauty of something conveys a sense of its truth. But those notions are not uncontroversial. So I just draw that to your attention. But anyway, from Gadamer's point of view, these ideas of a speech that stands for itself and, and bears its own authority are related ideas that distinguish philosophical and poetic speech on one side of a divide um, from the kind of speech that passes over into its object, everyday pragmatic type of speech. Okay. Um, so next, Gadamer draws on some aspects of the tradition of thinking about the nature of poetry and the nature of philosophy and two moments in particular that he uses to, to sort of illustrate that th this idea of uh, poetry and philosophy standing apart in this way that he's just described is not something that he's just invented on the spur of the moment, but that it has a kind of 
um, traditional weight to it and heritage. First, uh, there's an idea he takes from the 20th century French critic and poet uh, Paul Valéry. The idea that uh, in comparison to everyday language, poetic language is like a gold coin that is what it represents, that has the value that it represents. Everyday language is like um, common metal, inferior metal coins that don't actually have the value that they represent. Or a better example might be something like paper money that doesn't actually have the value it represents. This piece of paper is not actually intrinsically worth $100, but it says $100 on it, so we accept it. But of course, you could have a gold coin that was actually worth $100. And so uh, that comparison is, in Valerie's um, metaphorical usage, uh, equivalent to the comparison to uh, the comparison of everyday language and poetic language. Poetic language is the gold coin here, whereas everyday language is this inferior metal. Uh, on the side of philosophy, Gadamer says that we don't have any comparable historical remark to Valerie's about poetry, but we can look at Plato's dialogues as an example of language standing for itself. Philosophy is only accomplished in the dialogue or in the silent internalization of dialogue that we call thinking. Now, Plato, in addition to criticizing poetry, also criticized the written word itself and indicated a higher ontological status for philosophical thought. So ordinary language or doxa, opinion, is left behind in philosophical thought which perhaps therefore leaves the word behind. And there's a kind of interior, higher word that the Platonic dialogue represents. Uh, it starts out, of course, as ordinary words used in a distinctively dialectical or dialogical way, but it aims at transcending these words to a sort of higher language of ideas. And that's the properly philosophical language. So in comparison, in comparing this reading of Plato's dialogues as a kind of exemplar of the higher status of philosophical language and Valerie's comment about poetry referring to its higher status relative to everyday language, we get this idea shared by philosophy and poetry that there's something special and not just special in the sense of different and other, but special in the sense of actually higher about poetic and philosophical language. So that is, is going to set part of the problematic for this essay for Gadamer, which is what is it that plausibly can be said to make philosophy and poetry higher instances of language in this way rather than just different? And of course, we're still pursuing the question of what makes them different. But we should expect that these two questions are going to converge. The question, what makes philosophy higher and what makes poetry higher and what makes philosophy different and what makes poetry different are going to, are going to come together in this inquiry. Um, so the initial way he summarizes this is he says that uh, poetry is the word that stands And philosophy is the word that fades into the unsayable. Philosophy, poetry is the word that stands and philosophy is the word that passes into or fades into the unsayable. Here with this uh, kind of philosophy is the word that fades into the unsayable, you have this idea of that has often been the basis of a criticism of philosophy and philosophical language, namely that it's nonsense, because it tries to say things that are not really sayable. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about here. The idea is going to be rather that philosophy uh, has this kind of unending character that Gadamer uh, favors, as we saw in our discussion of his philosophical hermeneutics in the last video. The idea that philosophy, like poetry, 
um, is never going to be totalized, is never going to be completed. The unsayable that it's trying to grasp is never going to be completely captured. And so philosophy is this sort of unending dialogue, this unending conversation. And poetry, likewise, is, is this kind of indeterminacy and incompleteness. And that's not a deficiency of either philosophy or poetry, but it's it's part of what, what their unique value consists in, their, their, their higher value consists in. Okay, so this question about the proximity of these two ideas, of the word that stands and the word that, that fades into the unsayable, Gadamer is going to want to make a connection between these concepts, which on the face of it are not the same by any means. Uh, of course, we're not really exactly clear what's being referred to here yet, but uh, even on the, you know, on the face of them, we're not really sure what, what these are referring to. So one, thing he, one point he makes out is that both philosophy and poetry have a shared idealizing tendency. A shared idealizing tendency. Meaning a tendency towards the ideal. And a couple senses of, of the ideal uh, are connected here. And the way that Gadamer introduces this is by looking at the phenomenology founded by Edmund Husserl. Husserl's method of self-understanding called the reduction, the eidetic reduction, but you don't have to worry about the terminology for our purposes. But the reduction, the where the experience of all contingent reality is bracketed in something called the epoche. And only the essential remains to consciousness. And this is the realm of the ideal. Um, and primarily, in, in the first instance, it's the realm of the idea. So the idea, meaning the ideas that uh, the mind is con uh, constituted by or that it relates to immediately as opposed to external objects in this reduction of all phenomena to my ideas, only the essential remains to my consciousness. And this is something Gadamer says that occurs de facto in all true philosophizing. Philosophizing concerns the realm of the concept or the realm of ideas. These are the a priori essential structures of reality. That's the idealizing tendency in philosophy is, is the focus on the a priori essential structures of reality. What about in poetry? Well, something similar is true in poetry. There's an idealizing tendency of art. The artist elevates his or her creation to the level of an ideal spiritual reality. Gadamer even will say that this eidetic reduction of Husserl, the reduction of appearances and phenomena to their essential structures uh, in phenomenology is spontaneously fulfilled in the realm of art. And here the, the connection of ideal and illusion becomes emphasized more that the, the artist is concerned with the generation of illusions. But these illusions of reality are, are raised to the level of ideality. They're raised to the level of being essential structures of reality. Think about, in particular, religious art that aims to represent the absolute character of reality, God, you know, the different structures of the world, different levels of God's creation. Those are the sorts of things, the, the essence of man. That's an idealizing tendency within art. And uh, Gadamer would say that poetry partakes of that as much as any art does. So both poetry and philosophy share this uh, idealizing tendency, this focus on the essential structures of reality. And the a priori here idea becomes, in philosophy, the idea of, of a kind of purely rational contemplation of ideas and thoughts. And in poetry, the a priori is the idea of creation before the experience of what's actually real. The poet is concerned more with the way in which things should be according to their imagination rather than the way in which they are according to science or their everyday experience. 
So that's the this this a priori aspect. In other words, it's not taking its um, lead from the empirical reality, but rather it is attempting to rise above the empirical reality, and that gives you a, an initial sense of of the shared uh, transcendent and and just plain higher status of poet poetic and philosophical language, at least in its ambition, whether or not it actually um, can convince us that this ambition is well-founded is a totally different question, of course. But what Gadamer is describing here is the proximity of the, the language that is involved in this operation of idealization. So what is the relation of poetry and philosophy within the medium of language, then? And here, uh, Gadamer is going to take two, what he describes as extreme cases, which he thinks sort of provides the standard for each of these. And so not everything that's, that's uh, described as poetry will fall under uh, the lyric, and not everything that's philosophy will fall under dialectic or the dialectical concept. But they, for Gadamer, serve as the standard and also as the limit of the poetic. Uh, which is to say that the um, purest poetry is lyric poetry of a radical and extreme kind, what um, he describes as pure poetry and exemplified by the French poet Mallarmé, who was a major influence on Stevens and Eliot. So for our purposes, we can just think of Stevens and Eliot as examples rather than Mallarmé. But you can go back and look at Mallarmé too. Uh, and dialectic, which is going to be exemplified by Hegel's philosophy. And of course, uh, Mallarmé is not the only type of poetry there is, and he Hegel isn't the only type of philosophy there is, but Gadamer sees these uh, types of uh, language, as they're exhibited in Mallarmé and Hegel, as kind of a limit case of what all poetic and philosophical language partake of to some degree or other. And so all authentic poetry is going to have some lyricism to it. All authentic philosophy is going to involve this dialectical operation, in, at least in Gadamer's understanding. So what's characteristic of this, this kind of poetry of Mallarmé, this lyric pure poetry? What's characteristic of it? Well, a few remarks that Godber makes is it's it's the most untranslatable. Why? Because the musicality of the language is intensified here to the highest degree. So there, there's really a strong emphasis on the on the particular texture of the particular words and their musicality, and that of course is going to be a block to translation. It doesn't mean translation is impossible, but it means it's going to be particularly challenging and particularly difficult. The form of the poem is constructed by the constantly shifting balance of sound and sense. So there's an interplay between the musical dimension, the sound, and what the word means. And there's a kind of balancing act where these things are brought into a balance, but only um, in the way in which you might think of a, a ship on a very stormy sea leaning strongly to one side, strongly to another. You'll have passages where it's really difficult to make much sense of them, but they're very musical. Alternated with passages that as it were, will bring the, bo the boat, to use this metaphor, the boat or the ship of the poem, keep it from capsizing by bringing it back, by having throwing something in that has some greater intelligibility or sense. And we could look at examples in, in Stevens and in, in Eliot, where there's this alternation of very musical passages and passages that make sense, and they don't necessarily coincide, but they, they tend to balance each other out. So that what's created, he says, is a, is a kind of semantic field, a, a field of meaning that's, that's unique to this poem. It doesn't have meaning in an everyday sense, but it still has the power to uh, create imagery. It still has the power to generate a sense of meaning that perhaps doesn't really settle down into um, any translation into prose terms. In fact, 
strike the perhaps. It doesn't settle down into any translation into prose terms, but it flirts with uh, possible translations into prose terms. There's not one determinate meaning that it has, but it does. it's not completely meaningless either. There's a kind of um, pushing the envelope of meaninglessness for the sake of this greater musicality and, and, and linguistic beauty. Um, but the that line is not is not completely crossed. And then there's there's still a kind of a couple different unifying factors that he mentions. One is what he describes as the unity of creation, which is the structuring of sound, rhythm, rhyme, intonation, assonance, alliteration, these very stabilizing factors that, that pull things together. You know, repetitions, rhymes, um, sounds that echo each other and so forth in the poem, that, that keep the poem, give it some kind of cohesion, as well as the unity of everyday speech. There's still grammar, syntax, which, which may recede into the background in extreme cases of modernist poetry, but generally speaking, there's, you know, it's not just a matter of throwing grammar and, and, and syntax out the window. There's still a kind of logical structure, even though it, it may not completely um, have, have an obvious meaning to us. But those things hold the poem hold the poem together even while retaining this um, obscurity and indeterminacy. He says that the ambiguity and obscurity of pure poetry restores the word of everyday speech to its original possibility of naming, of calling into presence. This is related to what he calls the hermetic. The, that is to say, the esoteric or cryptic or sealed off character of modern poetry. Um, quite precisely because of the way in which it strikes us as something that's not penetrable by our intelligence, at least not without strong effort, it calls into presence the things that are named. It forces us to, to think about the imagery that it produces. Um, it, it takes us into its own world and doesn't deflect us or defer us someplace else as ordinary language in its ordinary use does, directs us towards some region of our everyday environment. Um, instead, it calls into presence what's in front of us, namely the poem. Now, part of this is due to, according to Gadamer, the flood of information that the modern age provides. Uh, it's only by alienating all familiar forms of speech that this calling into presence in poetry can occur. But at the same time, alienating all the familiar forms of speech threatens the very unity and intelligibility of the poem. So um, you begin to see here in this description ways in which poetry, which originally is described as the, the word that stands, is being described in ways that, that seem to fit this description of philosophy more, the, the way in which words fade into the unsayable. A lot of modern poetry seems to fade into the unsayable. That would be an apt description. Why? Because it's, it's trying to um, call attention to the words themselves in a way that resists the familiarity and cliche of their everyday usage, and that threatens unsayability. All right. So again, as we said, on his understanding, he selects lyric poetry and in particular the radical uh, lyricism of pure poetry exemplified by modern poetry and figures like Mallarmé or Wallace Stevens, we could add, uh, as a kind of extreme limit case that reveals to us the essential character of all poetry. All poetry is going to have this to various degrees, but the way they differ from each other is through increasing translatability. So from lyric poetry, you go to epic and tragic, which are more essentially narrative forms, um, then to the novel and to any demanding prose that still has a quote-unquote literary character. These are all going to have something of the character of lyricism, but to, to lessening degrees. So pure poetry is kind of the, the, the pure, as its name suggests, the purest case of what poetry is, but these other things also are poetry because they participate in, the, in this lyrical character that he's just described. Um, the various functions, the unifying operations, the creative, 
unifying operation and the naming functions um, and some of the ambiguities and threatened unintelligibility are there too. All right. So that's the uh, the first part, the, the poetic part. What about the second? So uh, philosophy was going to be exemplified by dialectic in the way that lyric poetry exemplified the character of poetry. So dialectical philosophy. What is language in the context of philosophy? Again, Gadamer takes what he takes to be an extreme example, just like Mallarmé's uh, modern poetry is an extreme example of poetry that tells us something about what the essence of poetry is. Hegelian dialectic, the dialectic of uh, GWF Hegel, is an extreme example of philosophical language that tells us something about the character of philosophical language. And here we certainly have uh, words that some people have argued ever since Hegel wrote fade into the unsayable. It's a, been a commonplace uh, ever since his uh, first works to question whether this made any sense or whether he was trying to say something that isn't really sayable. So what's the basic relationship here to everyday propositions? Everyday language consists in logically and grammatically formed propositions, the kinds of things that you can schematize in what we know as propositional logic. But Hegel regarded such propositions as unsuitable for expressing philosophical truth. The problem is that the, the form of the proposition, like subject-object, subject-predicate, which suggests a, a kind of substance-property relation, for example, uh, is unsuitable for expressing philosophical truth. We can't read philosophical truth off the grammar of our everyday language. This would suppose that the object of philosophy is given and known in advance, like the processes and things that we see in the world. Uh, and this is not the case. Philosophy is not concerned with everyday ordinary objects, but rather it's concerned with ideas. And Ideas are not given in our everyday experience. They might help to organize our experience, but they're transcendental. This is the Kantian idea, uh, Kant's idea that uh, philosophical language transcends everyday empirical language. Philosophy doesn't deal with things, it deals with ideas. And Gadamer will trace this lineage quite correctly back to, to Plato himself, and arguably the birth of philosophy, at least in the West. Uh, philosophy is concerned with ideas, it's not concerned with the everyday empirical reality. That's the province of um, the special sciences, deal with everyday things. We philosophers deal with ideas, universal ideas. And this means for Hegel, now back to Hegel's understanding of dialectical philosophy, the medium of philosophy is the imminent, that is to say within, within the concept, and dynamic mirror play of the categories of philosophy itself. In Hegel, opposite concepts are reconciled in a higher Aufhebung is the, the German word. This is dialectic, is where are we? German word, which is hard to translate. Translated as the sublation, but who knows what that means? But there's the, the Aufhebung, the sublation. That's the essence of um, the dialectical procedure for Hegel is Aufhebung or sublation, which means that opposite, opposite concepts are reconciled in a higher sublation. They are, their, their opposition is canceled, but their essences are preserved and raised to a higher level. So just a couple of quick, quick rough and ready examples of this to give you a general idea, but of course you'd have to study Hegel's philosophy to really see what this amounts to. Uh, but for example, think about the, the opposition between rationalism and empiricism in early modern philosophy that many of you will be familiar with. Uh, this, one could argue, is an opposition you know, between is the basis of knowledge uh, pure reason or is the basis of knowledge experience? And one could argue that this opposition is sublated uh, and you know it's 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 canceled. It's the best parts are preserved and it's raised to a higher level in Kantian transcendental idealism. At least that's what the Kantians would say about the opposition between rationalism and empiricism. Or think about, for example, the way in which a Christian would say Greek religion 
Greek philosophy, rather, is a better way of putting it. Greek philosophy and Hebrew religion are, their opposition is sublated in Christianity. It's recon their their uh, opposition is, is reconciled, canceled, uh, preserved, and raised to a higher level within classical Christianity. So I don't know how helpful those examples are for you, but um, that gives you an idea. So philosophy is about, uh, in this sense, trying to reconcile conceptual contradictions and oppositions at the level of ideas, at the level of uh, very essential or fundamental categories of thought. Um, so the examples I gave are, you know, um, would be part of philosophy, but not the ultimate part. And in Hegel, everything has to be part of the system. Everything uh, that could be, you know, possibly philosophically true has to find a place within the one true philosophy. The, the different philosophical systems in particular... So rationalism, empiricism, Kantianism, going you know to the ancient world, the different philosophical schools of the ancient world like Stoicism and Epicureanism, Platonism and Aristotelianism, um, Scholasticism, all of these different views have to be reconciled through this process of Aufhebung or sublation, which takes place through dialectical opposition and reconciliation of the various views where they represent one soul wisdom, but in a contradictory form. Now, Gadamer will claim, make the rather startling claim, that this is actually the uh, standard and the limiting case of philosophy. All philosophy has this dialectical character. And if you reflect a little bit on the way in which modern professional philosophy proceeds, we can say a priori that if I come up with some new theory, like let's say I come up with a new theory of mind, or you know, a new philosophy of mind, a new way of reconciling the, the mind-body problem, if I publish that theory in a philosophic, professional philosophical journal, it is almost 100% certain that if it get, gets any notice or attention at all, it's going to get opposition. People are going to contradict me and criticize me. Right? So that tends to preserve or... Um, uh, confirm Gadamer's idea that this is something of this Hegelian idea of philosophy always aiming at, you know, as being this totality of all these different oppositions and reconciling them. And then that just leads to a new opposition. It does seem to be something of the character of, of philosophy. But what Gadamer wants to do, as we saw in the other video, is, is not to bemoan this fact and say, oh, woe is us, philosophy isn't science, we can't make progress, but to actually celebrate this and to to, as it were, cast it, recast it as a dialogue that's an unending conversation that continues to go on. And the same is what he, want, what he wants to say of poetry. Poetry also, he says, is a never completed task. And here is something you don't really need to argue for. People aren't saying poor poetry and isn't making progress. You know, people don't think that about poetry. They assume that every you know, new development in poetry is going to lead to further developments. And those further developments are going to lead to still further developments. And, and all that's well and good. You know, there's no problem with poetry being an unending conversation. And Gadamer would say, based on his interpretation and um, Aufhebung, his sublation of Hegelian dialectic, that that also is part of philosophy. Philosophy should be this unending conversation. It's not actually totalizing in the way that Hegel thought. But it is something that is, um, in its best realization, going to go on and on and on and on. And there's no, there's no problem with that. No essential problem. Okay. Um, because of this, both poetry and philosophy have the character of never completed tasks. And they're under the sway of what he describes as a dialectic of uncovering and withdrawal. This is this... Heideggerian notion of, 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 of truth as unconcealment. Truth unconceals something, reveals something, but at the same time it conceals something else. I can occupy the world of a poem or a particular philosophical worldview, but it's always going to be to the exclusion of some other world that belongs to some other incompatible poem or some other um, philosophical worldview that's incompatible with the one I'm occupying now. And of course, I can try to, as it were, switch between the two and, and bring them together in a higher sublation. 
and that would be fine. But there's always going to be this dialectic of uncovering withdrawal, nevertheless. It's part of both philosophy and poetry. And because of this feature, Gadamer asserts, and here's an important claim, that poetical and philosophical types of speech share another common feature, namely they can never be false. Poetry can never be false. Philosophy can never be false. Now, in both those cases, you might question this claim. So what is he getting at here? Why, why does he feel confident in asserting this? Well, basically, this is because there's no external standard against which they might be measured and to which they might correspond. There's no external standard against which they might be measured and to which they might correspond. Genuine philosophy, of course, something can fail to be philosophy. It can be just bad philosophy. That's a different question. But if it's genuine philosophy, it's going to be legitimizing its own terms within its own language. And there is no external standpoint from which one can legitimately say it's false. Of course, you could say, I have this other philosophy and my philosophy contradicts yours. But you can't say that, that you know mine is true and yours is false. Because remember, philosophy is not dealing with things that um, correspond to some external standard or external reality. It's rather dealing with the internal, the imminent dynamic dialectical character of concepts themselves. And so there's no external standard by which one might judge it to be true or false. It doesn't make sense to say philosophy is true or false. But that doesn't mean that there's no way that you can criticize philosophy or poetry. Rather than criticizing philosophy or poetry as false, he says that both of these can be empty. They might not, they're empty when they don't live up to themselves. And that's kind of what I was getting at when I was saying that the, there could be just bad philosophy and bad poetry. Gadamer's term here would be empty. Um, and it, I think actually what he's talking about might be better described as bad philosophy and bad poetry. Uh, or since both philosophy and poetry can be normative terms, that is terms that, that imply a kind of implicit praise, we could say that, you know, that's not even philosophy. That's just um, sophistry, empty sophistry. Or we could say that's not even poetry. That's just rhetoric of everyday life. Or that's just imitation of some other poetry. It's imitation poetry. It's not authentic poetry. That's kind of the idea. So it is possible to criticize philosophy or poetry, but not by saying it's true or false. Philosophy and poetry, in a certain way, then, are the, the standards of truth. And they can only be compelling and legitimate from within their own terms and their own um, standards. They, there is no external standard. Um, if it fails, it fails by its own internal standards. It, it's empty as poetry. It's empty as philosophy, according to the intrinsic character of, of, of poetry, po poetic and philosophical language itself. But it can't be evaluated according to some external standard. That's um, that's where he winds up here. So those are his concerns and uh, considerations about philosophy and poetry. Uh, so we have a sense now in general of, of, of Gadamer's general philosophical approach, philosophical hermeneutics, how that leads to an interest in poetry to begin with, which we covered in the last video, and then his understanding of how poetry and philosophy uh, complement each other, overlap with each other, share common features, and therefore might uh, inform each other in, um, in various ways. So we'll take this now to our discussion of Gadamer on Ceylon in the upcoming videos.